Or if you want to kill me, you should wait until that light goes off, because otherwise you will be easily identified. Um, yeah, so we are in chapter one. We were talking about um, descriptive statistics, summarizing a, a large data set with graphics and key numbers. And yeah, we were talking about different graphics, I guess, in the end here. And we talked about uh, the dot plot, the box plot, and the scatter plot. And we didn't talk about the histogram. I think this is perfectly where we stopped the last time. So the histogram is for a continuous variable. You remember a continuous variable was something that could have basically any value on an interval. So we don't have a set of prescribed values, but an interval. So anything can happen along an interval. And so a data set would, would be sitting like, like that somehow. What does the histogram do? Well, we prescribe a set of Okay, let me like this. We take a set of prescribed subintervals and then we just count the number of observations in each subinterval, right? And then we make a bar which sort of the height represents the number of observations inside. So here are some and there are a few more and even more and almost as many, and then just one here. So this figure here would be a histogram for this data set, right? And what's the point of that? Well, it gives us a fair and quick um, idea of the distribution of the data, right? So when we come just to the next uh, notes here, we will start, start talking about probability distributions, but this histogram is in a way an approximation of a probability distribution for the variable that we are talking about here. So we might imagine that the distribution of these data would look something maybe like this. So this is the histogram. And I can just maybe So figure one six in the compendium, I can maybe, yeah, I'll, I will show you actually. Um, I'm just gonna do one thing before that. So So these are just keywords that I'm going to refer to because I'm going to show you from the compendium what these things mean more or less. Um, so yeah. there's the box plot and. This thing here is a histogram for the variable. If you remember this demographic data, we have for 109 countries. And the variable here is the average female life expectancy in, in the various countries. Um, so there are quite narrow sub-intervals, but you get this idea of a skewed distribution like this. So that's the histogram. Um, now, categorical variables, we remember what it was. 
there are variables with yeah, with just as a few values and often not numeric like OECD, Asia, for instance, if it's a regional variable here. Um, so these are sort of the main graphics and summaries that we do for categorical variables and I will just show you what this is. You probably more or less know from before, but let's just uh, agree on the terminology here. So I'm going to start, maybe I should write better frequency, frequency tables, not freak tables. Uh, frequency table, okay, let's consider, okay, a categorical variable, it will have values like say A, B, C, and you have N observations, and the frequency table, it would just count how many A's, how many B's, how many C's, and maybe give you a percentage of that. And this is something we can easily do with SPSs, for instance. So I'm just now going to show you how it looks. If I click here, then this will go away. How can I get rid of this toolbar here? Um, click on tools again. Tools. And again. Good. So we might just go to. Yeah. So there's not the sharpest uh, print here, but. This is a frequency table for the va variable that, that uh, puts the country into or assigns the predominant religion to the country. So it's animist, it's Buddhist, Catholic, and so on. And the frequency, there are four countries who are said to be animist mm, uh, mainly, which is 3.7% of the whole sample, and so on. Uh, what's the biggest bunch here is the Catholic, 41 of the 109 countries, um, which is about 38% and so on. So it, this is not difficult to understand. That's the frequency table. And the graphical representation chosen to present data like this, rather than looking maybe at this table, you can get an even more striking visual um, display of it is to make a bar plot or a pie plot, or we call it maybe a bar chart or a pie chart. And you know actually what this is, I guess. To the left is a bar plot, bar chart, and to the right is a pie chart. Any of these you can make with SPSS with a few clicks, and you're there. You can add percentages to the slices here and so on. So it's very nice. It gives you directly an idea of the distribution of various categories here. Okay, so we know when I talk about the pie chart, you will know what I'm talking about. What's a cross tabulation? Well, that just means I have two categorical variables, and then I would like to say how many classified by this uh, criteria is also classified like this with the other criteria. Okay, so when I talk generally like this, it might be difficult to understand, but we, if we stick to this demographic data, there are two. two obvious categorical variables. It's the main religion in a country, and it's, for instance, the region where the country resides. And for some reason, you might be interested in cross-tabulating those two. And that would look something like this. The print is much better on paper, I hope. Yeah. It's something with a PDF and the screen that doesn't match completely here. 
So this is a cross tabulation of these two categorical uh, variables. Here is the region, OECD, East Europe, Africa, and so on. And here are the religions which I, in this case, have manipulated a little bit because there are some religions with only one country and so on. And I call them just other. Otherwise, the table <laughs> becomes extremely large. So you have the main, which are Buddhist, Catholic, Muslim, Orthodox, Protestants, and others here. So if you see closely here, um, it's really difficult to see here, but um, in the OECD region, there are 10 Catholic countries, which constitutes here 47.6 of the total uh, OECD sample. Right, so you can get percentages along this direction. How many are these 10 out of the total OECD countries? Or you could have percentages down here. How many are these 10 of the total number of Catholic countries? And so on. This is things you just choose in SPSS to display at your will. So that's a cross tabulation. So in, when we start doing SPSS, this is the thing we are going to do, descriptive statistics, producing cross tabulations and graphics and stuff. And then I say something like clustered charts. We're going to go into that later a bit. But the idea is just how do you visualize something like this? It's, it's not so cool to read this large table, actually. And you, well, if you want a quicker sort of picture of that, you might want to produce something like this, which is just a, a cluster of pie charts, actually. So each of these pies here are representing one region, and then the coding is common for the whole uh, thing. So for instance, Latin America strikes out being almost exclusively Catholic, while the Middle East is, as we know, mainly Muslim countries and so on. Yeah. So that's a quick tour through some, some summary tables and graphics for categorical variables, right? And that puts us to the end of uh, lecture one, actually. <coughs> There's just one question I would like you to think about. Uh, um, and maybe we'll answer it in a few weeks or so. Look at this picture here. Maybe we can consider, which is this in the compendium? So it's this figure, I hope, uh, figure one tree. And it's a correlation of zero point seventy four. What you see is that the countries where you have people tending to live or women tending to live longer, also more people live in cities. So I'm just going to ask you maybe a silly question. Does it mean it's more healthy? To live in cities? Well, it seems in those countries where people mainly live in cities, they tend to live longer. So there should be better health <laughs> in cities. So that's my question. And you can think about it. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later. OK. So now we're on 
to what I call lecture one, note two. Uh, okay. It should really say chapter one, note two. I, last year I, I called the chapters lectures because in the beginning I thought I would be able to do one chapter each lecture. But it tended to be what I call lectures tended to be three lectures or two lectures and so on. So the picture got a little bit messy. So this is the second note for chapter one, actually. In the new version of the compendium, you will see I call the chapters chapters and not lectures. So we're going to just rush. No, we're gonna, not going to rush, but we're going to just move through this. Um, still, for most of you, this will be, or maybe for all of you, it will be familiar topics, but maybe in a different language. So if you studied statistics in Portuguese or German or Norwegian, you wouldn't have these names for random variables. But we're going to talk carefully about what it is, and then you will recognize it in your Portuguese or whatever. Normal distribution, everyone heard about that, I guess. And we're going to talk in the end about uh, yeah, what is really the heart of statistics is what's called inferential statistics. We're going go into that very lightly in the beginning. It's about confidence intervals. Everybody knows what is a confidence interval, yes. more or less? It's, it's an interval where you can claim that something has happened with some probability. Yeah, basically. So we're going to discuss a few of those in the end, I hope, today. OK. So let's take it from almost scratch. Let's assume we understand what is probability. Um, then we say any quantity in the world or in, yeah, with some uncertainty to its values, that is what we would call a, a random variable. So we write x, meaning x can be 3, or it can be 7, or, or many other things, but we don't know in a way beforehand. So it, there's an uncertainty. To it. Um, yeah. Right. So they can be categorical if, for instance, I talk about the color of the next car I see. It's a categorical variable. It can be red, it can be blue, it can be black. But uh, I don't know. So, of course, in business, stochastics, now, or <laughs> logistics, um, and most other sciences also, but in the business world, in the planning of logistics and so on, there is just a bunch of quantities with uncertain values. So the use of random variables is absolutely fundamental in, in serious planning of, of business and logistics. So you've got to have some idea about probability distributions and what happens if things are uncertain and so on. So it's not exactly something that you haven't been thinking about. So we talk about random variables, and when we talk about numerical, it's the same as when we talked about data, when we had data. When we say data variables, we sort of think about the spreadsheet or something looking like SPSS. Um, and there's 3.7, 4.2, 3.1. 
and here is uh, her prize. Whatever. Okay. So then we'll call this a variable, but this would typically be observations, observed values of a random variable that we have in a data set. So we talk about variables here, and we talk about random variables here. They are two different things, but uh, they have a huge common overlap. So when we talk about uh, random variables, they can be numerical. That just means what is uncertain is some number, for instance, the oil price next week or the demand for your commodity next month, and so on. That would be a, a numerical variable. And it can be discrete or continuous in the same way as we talked about data variables. So this one looks typically like a continuous, because we're measuring on an interval. We use decimals and stuff. But this could be 1, 1, 2, 1. Well, yeah. number of children, for instance, for a uh, family or something. This will be then discrete. So same with our variables. My oil price next week. would typically be continuous. Whereas uh, if I'm a car salesman, the number of cars I will sell next week in a small shop at least would be discrete. So you remember this one, the number of something, yeah? Number of cars sold next week. I don't know that, but it's a random variable, but I know it's not going to be 10. It, it's never been 10 for my little business. It used to be 0, 1, or 2. Or in a good week, it could be 3. So maybe it's 0, 1, 2, 3, and very rarely 4. And then I would say I have a discrete random variable. Okay. So I'm just going to stress this connection that we are talking now about some sort of theoretical random variable with a probability distribution that we will discuss. And on the other hand, we have the practical side of it, um, a data set that will be observed values for my random variable, typically repeated observations. Between, uh, between a variable and a random variable. Um, are you talking about a variable mathematically? Yes. Well, uh, how can I? Well, in mathematics, you say x is a variable. X is um, x, x is the speed of a bullet, let's say. Hmm? Now I'm going to talk physics. Speed of a bullet that you shoot out of a gun. And why is the, uh, why is the resistance, air resistance? Huh? Well, yeah, whatever. So OK, we shoot this bullet out here with some speed x and then it flies a certain distance. If this is 0, it flies a certain distance. And then in your physics book in high school, you would say, OK, y equals f of x. And you say that x is a variable and y is another variable, and x, y is completely dependent on x. 
but you don't talk about any random things here. The random thing comes when you have uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So here you would say that, OK, you can draw the graph y. How would this look? It will start from the y axis. Start something like this. And it depends on how complicated your model is, really. If you start considering air, air resistance, you will have a complicated function. But we can agree that the faster it goes out, basically, the further it will go. So it should be an increasing function. Maybe something like that. I don't know. So these are the kind of variables that you use in deterministic physics, for instance. But the random variable is specifically used to describe phenomena where you don't know in advance what's going to happen. Right. So if I said the x is a random variable here, I don't know what the speed is going to be. Then I would say also I have a probability distribution for the landing point, for instance. Yeah. Not sure if I perfectly answer your question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So, uh, any random variable has a probability distribution. Um, sometimes, at least in theory, we know the probability distribution. You might argue that in real life we don't even know exactly the probability distribution. But we can agree that there is a probability distribution. And this is very different for discrete and continuous variables. So for a discrete variable, I can only have, say, it can be infinite, but very often it's, it's finite. So these are the only possible values. So typically, they would be, if you're counting something, there would be 0, 1, 2, up to k minus 1 or something. Yeah. And for a discrete variable, the probability distribution assigns a specific probability like this. And this is normally then greater than 0. Okay. So for a Norwegian woman, you might say that when she, I mean, when she's 12, the number of children she's going to have is a random variable. When she's 60, it's no longer a random variable. Because then we have seen the realization, as we say. We have seen what happened. So she might have had two kids. But before being able to have children, it's a random variable. And the values are probably something like this. Uh, My cousin has seven children, which is very high for Norway. It's <laughs> almost the record of the year, I would say. Um, so if x is the number of children, we could say, we could estimate, we could have a sample of the whole uh, population and do all kind of proper research. And then we can say that probability that she will when age 50, she will have had two children is 0 0.37. That's a discrete probability distribution. And we will visualize this distribution using kind of a bar diagram. So it's not unlikely to have zero children. Uh, it's probably a bit more likely to have one. I think maybe 
two would be the most frequent and then it starts to become much rarer to have four or five and so on. So the height or the area of this thing here is exactly the probability that x equals two. Yeah, you've seen all these things before. We just go through it uh, to make sure we talk the same language. these probabilities are usually greater than zero for a discrete variable. On the other hand, when we deal with a continuous variable, we need to do things completely differently. We cannot any longer talk about individual probabilities for one single outcome if we agree that in this interval uh, any value is possible. Because if these are possible, then th this will be possible and between here and between here and between here and between here. And there are simply too many of them mathematically to be able to assign a positive probability to each outcome here. So we have the striking and perhaps non-intuitive fact that if you have a continuous variable, like modeling the height of a random student grabbed in the hallway here. I measure him very carefully, exactly, and his height will be somewhere on this scale. But any outcome would, in principle, be possible. And to pre-assign a probability to 1.76 exactly is, in fact, not possible. Or, in fact, we have to s agree that it's zero. Because, yeah, okay, I think I said more or less because why. Um, so, what do we do? Well, the answer is down there. We don't discuss so much uh, individual probabilities in this case. It's more interesting to talk about things like probability that x is, say, okay, what's the probability that this guy is less than one point? 80. Well, that should be a number greater than zero. Um, yeah. So this is called a cumulative probability because it's accumulated as we go upwards to this limit. We accumulate the probability of all in outcomes. There are infinitely many of them and in a way the whole total adds to a number so let's say it could be 0 point uh, or 71 for instance I don't know that number but yeah I mean, A could be, uh, that's, that's just a number that you, uh, it's just arbitrary. I mean, this is just an example. So just for example, I say 180. Yeah, but then because of a continuum, there's no limitation. There can be a limitation, or there, there can, doesn't have to be a limitation. But uh, that uh, depends on your uh, setting, in a way. For instance, here, you would agree that if A is, 3.0, there's no probability above that for the height of a student. Um, I've never seen a student even close to three meters. I mean, they can be high after taking in uh, chemicals and stuff, but not <laughs> physically high. Like that. Um, and I mean, to get an example where it's an absolute no doubt limit, say I, I, my x variable is I just stop a clock 
and look at the seconds past last minute. It has to be somewhere between 0 and 60. It cannot be 61, because then it's 1. But so you get a continuous distribution on the interval from 0 to 60. But inside here, anything is possible. So in, in practical situation, it will always be limited somehow. Uh, yeah. And so we can talk about um, uh, if x is the oil price. This is the random variable that Norwegians uh, care most about, I guess. Um, or which we have been had most uh, gain from. It's our favorite random variable, you might say. Um, but it may not be in the future. So people are analyzing probabilities like this. What's the probability in 2016 summer, the oil price? Summer 2016 uh, being A equal to 60, B equal to between 60 and 70 dollars. Well, there's some probability of that, and nobody knows. But those who deal with, I mean, a lot of people need to think about such things. Those who deal with uh, stock brokers, for instance, they have to uh, continuously assess, try to assess the values of oil companies, drilling companies, supply, oil supply companies and stuff. All of them are highly dependent on sort of answers to questions like this. So they have to come up with some estimate, at least. But there is no one who really knows the probability there. And th those who have the best estimates, they are often those who make most money out of such things, of course. So that's a competition inside statistics. OK, yeah, before we take a break, let's see how in technical terms, do we manage to specify such cumulative probabilities? Well, we do it with what we call densities. And I would like to write probability. This is a very important concept. And the graph that you see there is a probability density function. And it works in the way that we have a variable x, and all the cumulative probabilities are defined in terms of this function here, so in that way. So the probability of being less than or equal to a is what is left of a. Um, and if we want to talk about the probability for being in an interval, of course, it's this area here between A and B below the graph of the density. You all, all probably have seen this. Um, so it's, it's important to understand this concept. <coughs> um, and let me say one thing that is quite important. Continuous variable, we do not need to be precise about using a less than or equal or a strict less than sign here. So what I'm saying is that the probability of being less than or equal to A 
it will always equal the probability of being strictly less than a. And the reason for that is, of course, uh, the difference between those two is the case where we hit exactly at A, right? And to hit exactly this one, I said somewhere before I took it away, has probability zero. So these are in practice the same things, so they should have the same probability. This event and this event is the same thing. And this is, of course, not the case for discrete variables. So So, for instance, if this uh, x was the number of <coughs> children, clearly the probability of having x less than 1 means having no children, actually, because children don't come in decimal <laughs> fractions, luckily. Uh, so, whereas this means, I mean, this. This means x zero or x equals to one. So there are totally different outcomes. I have one child, and I can tell you there's a striking difference between having zero and one. In fact, so the probability should not be the same. But if someone asks you, okay, this is sixty dollars, this is seventy dollars, what's the probability that the oil price is between? and including 60 and 70, or strictly between 60 and 70, it's going to be the same. Because the probability of having perfectly $60 is zero in this model. Yeah. So that's good. Let's have something like 15 minutes break.